the Cambridge Philological Society, the pronunciation of Latin in the Augustan period. And this is the coat of arms of Cambridge University. London, 1887. Pronunciation of Latin in the Augustan period. It having been felt by some teachers at Cambridge that the time had come to make a further attempt to correct the errors of the ordinary English pronunciation of Latin, a letter of inquiry was sent out to ascertain the amount of support which such an attempt would receive. This called forth very encouraging answers from lecturers in almost every college in Cambridge, and not a few schoolmasters. The following statement was therefore drawn up by a small committee. It has been fully discussed at two meetings of the Society, and it is now put forth by the Society as an approximate statement of the pronunciation of Latin by the educated classes in the Augustan period. Now, this text is actually quite important. It's one of the texts that marks the beginning of the use of the restored classical pronunciation across the entire uh, United Kingdom and then spreading out into the Commonwealth and across the English-speaking world. And the old English pronunciation of Latin is now extinct. The Church still uses the Florentine pronunciation, which is the uh, dialect of Italian that became standard Italian in the 19th century. And the pronunciation of, of uh, Florence then became the standard pronunciation across the entire um, Italian peninsula, although you still find variant pronunciations in various places, villages in the south and in Sicily and so on. So here we go. Uh, summary of the pronunciation of Latin in the Augustan period. Um, vowels. So this is a very brief summary. It's very useful. So letters, Latin A, and then we have uh, the English A as in psalm, salve, have, so alas, constance, and the A and A are found in aha, aha. So this letter is formed with uh, oro rotundo, open mouth, so amat, danai. Nota bene. A ah, in Latin was never pronounced as in mate or as in man and mat. So not pater, pater noster, uh, etc. So e, as in the French e, a closed e sound. So it is the first part of the English diphthong in skein and grey and ray and rain. So E as in tela, tensus, dear. Tela, tensus, dear. And an open E as in sped. And it's short as in tenet, ferus, impleas. Nota bene. The Latin E was never pronounced as the English E in C. I. As in machine, quinine, so tritus, in fensus, and um, is, as in feel and feet, pravi. The Latin I was never I, as in fine, and of course in the English pronunciation of Latin it was fine, and so we have cacti, um, sancti, and so on. Um, you still find the English pronunciation used, of course, in biology by some biologists, so that the classical pronunciation is now starting to push it aside. The short, as in fit and skim, so citis fecit nisi. In certain cases where the spelling varies between I and U, as in maximus maximus, as in German U. Note the difference between closed and open vowels, otherwise called the narrow and wide, is caused by drawing up the part of the tongue with which the sound is produced and making it more convex than it is in its natural relaxed position. 
and this causes a narrowing of the passage of the sound, whence the name. So there's no difference in quality so much. The Latin final I seems to have had an intermediate sound between E and I, as in heri, yesterday, um, written in the time of Quintilian as heri with an E. And Quintilian says in the institutions that in um, heri neque e plane neque i auditur. Um, so it's not an E, it's not an I. And this is supported by various spellings on inscriptions. So sibi, sibe, sibei, uh, quasi, quase, quasei, and so on. And interestingly enough, the, the verb habeo, um, the, uh, the e sound in habeo um, moves and it becomes more like an i. So it's habio. And in fact, in later Latin, it's written with an i. Um, so when I pronounce Latin, uh, the word habeo, I don't say habeo, uh, I say habeo. Modified u has two sounds in North German. Um, when it's long, it's close, as in grün and gute. Um, and so in French, lune and ego. And when short, it's open, as in hota and schutzen. These sounds may be pro produced approximately by producing i, as in a machine, and e, as in fit, respectively, with rounded lips. Um, but uh, so we have it. Let's move on. O, as in the French, show, for, so roris, consus. Conto, or the first part of the English diphthong in groan, loan, so o. And short, open o, the nearest representative in English is in not and rock, o, o, always, boom, modo. The u, as in ruin, intrude, or the u in poop, as in the poop deck of a ship. And nota bene, the Latin u was never pronounced like the u in acute and mule, which is u. So, oes, baum, modo, and uh, umor, tun, tunsus, and genu. And the short u as in full, and the u in foot. So, um, uti, and tus. Nota bene, Latin u. Never as an ordinary English U in but and cut and luck. Why? Um, as in the uh, E sound, so gerus, scopus, kumba, um, and so on. It's a Greek sound. The great difference between the English and Latin pronunciations of the same vowel symbols is due to the fact that the pronunciation of English has changed while the spelling has not changed with it. So the symbols A, E, I, O and U no longer in English have their original values. So A and E and O have become diphthongs. And the A sound in mate being sounded like A in vein and gray and the I in I and the O in ow as in grow. And the English E in C and the U in RU have a slight consonantal ending, which is Y in the one case and W in the other. And the English U is generally U. Diphthongs. So AE in tie-dye and AU in Laos and Laudo and O in Foidus and EI in Pompeii and the EU in Seo and Neuter. Um, and the ui in qi and huic. The pronunciation of these diphthongs, of which the last three are extremely rare, is best learned by first sounding each vowel separately and then running them together. So i as an i, au as an au, oi as an oe, ei as an ei, eo as an eo, and ui as an ui, and then shortening them. Nota bene, the English pronunciation, which rhymes um, heidus and fadus with fidas, is quite incorrect. The pronunciation of the Latin O 
seems to have fluctuated. Or, which is generally, although not always close, was sometimes nearer to the English or as in law, but more often to the French R, with a higher position of the tongue, while the short open O is sometimes nearer to the English O in not, but more often to the German O in stock. Generally speaking, Latin E and O are the Italian close E and O, while the Latin O and E are the Italian open O and E. So, generally speaking. I was not far from the German um, I and had a tendency to become open. So, as in men and sped. But it was not until the 6th century that I and E became quite confused. Au is the German au in house. The nearest sound in English is OU. Um, I'm just going to run down here to in, in house, which should be pronounced broadly house. A is the English diphthong in grey and rain and mate. EO as an Italian neutro. And UI as an Italian colui. And the old Latin diphthongs AI, pronounced as the Greek AI, as in Azaya, broadly pronounced, and OI as in LOIN, had disappeared before the Augustan period. Let's run up now to these letters. The letter C, always as English K, never as S or as C before E and I. Thus, uh, Kekini. Kyknus, skit, etc., and condicio, never conditio. So, kano, kekini, kyknus, keo, skit, haske, condicio. The qu sound, he says here, yeah, uh, the, the, the committee came up with this, this always should be qu as in quick, inquit. G. As in English G in got, get, begin, never as j, as in jibe or generous. So, gaudio, genus, gingiwa, age. N, as ng in sing, so n before c, uh, n in sink, thus incipit, inquam, congero, incipit, inquam, congero. Then T, D, N, and L, nearly as in English. So, adit, natus, luna, clientem, editio, constans. Nota bene, editio, and never editio. Now, let's go down to footnote 7 here. Um, the Latin GN, footnote 6 first, after a vowel, has been supposed to have the sound of hngn, so um, as in hangnail, so regnum, being pronounced regnum, cognomen as in cognomen. And uh, there are some who doubt this. Um, if you look at my uh, Latin video on the Lord's Prayer, uh, there's a lot of discussion in the footnotes of people's comments on the pronunciation of regnum. And whether you say regnum, um, cognomen, or not, um, it's an argument uh, to be had one way or the other. There are authorities on both sides, so you just choose. Now, um, with T, T and D, the tongue should touch the teeth instead of the forepart of the palate. Um, there's a lot of talk by some um, speakers of restored classical pronunciation about whether these sounds should be aspirated or not. Um, there's no discussion of that here whatsoever. Um, and uh, some people are very, very uh, great sticklers for this aspiration or non-aspiration of the T and the D. Um, quite frankly, I think it doesn't matter very much at all. So, editio, never editio. S. Um, always voiceless, as in um, sus, accurso, tristes, so, as in his, um, hist, never voiced, as in has, 
And you'll find that people do make this mistake. Uh, it's one of, the, one of the more frequent errors if you listen to people on, on YouTube um, speaking Latin and restored classical, is that um, a voiced S creeps in where it shouldn't. P, B and M, except for the final M, as in the English, plumbo. And let's look down at footnote number nine here. I'm just scrolling down slowly to not give you a headache. The pronunciation of final M is not free from doubt. It is clear that it was more weakly sounded than at the beginning or in the middle of a word. So when a consonant followed it, the M must have remained consonantal, as the vowel which preceded was lengthened in position. Thus tum tenet, tum canet, were scanned like that long, short, short. Before a vowel, however, or before H followed by a vowel, both the M and the preceding vowel were disregarded in scansion. Montain, abet, being scanned da, da, ta, just like mons, abet, or montabet. So in the first case, the M was probably assimilated to the following consonant, becoming ng before gutturals. So, mensang gravem, being pronounced mensang gravem. And then I'm running down here to the footnote at the bottom of the next page. Just hold with me. Um, so, quan quam for quan quam, and quan quam for quan quam. N before T, D, N, S, and I, consonant. So, mensam tenet being pronounced mensang tenet. And quam yam, quan yam. Before R and L, it was completely assimilated. So, Mensan levem being pronounced mensan levem. Um, mensan rodem being pronounced mensan rodem. The final M was probably absorbed into the preceding vowel, which was nasalized when it's followed by a vowel, thus adopting the customary mark for a nasal vowel, an, an. And the nasalized vowel thus formed was slurred on to the following vowel, like any non nasalized vowel. Thus, flocton akipit was pronounced flocton akipit. Quan uh, quan inkipit pronounced, so we wouldn't say quan quan inkipit, but quan quan inkipit. And you'll listen to me pronouncing that in Latin, this is the way I do it. So nasal vowels are produ produced by sending the voice in part through the nose. Um, the French vowels in en, en, un, vin are familiar examples of nasal vowels. However, there's a note here. Um, Mr. A. J. Ellis, however, believes that the M was always omitted in speaking and the following consonant pronounced as if it were doubled. So he said quorum pars, he would pronounce quorup pars, um, spargam flores as sparga flores, animamque as um, animacque. Final im, and, and I don't know anyone that does that, so that's a deviant pronunciation that I don't know anyone that pronounces restored classical that does that, but it may have been what the Romans did. Final im, uh, followed by I consonant, he pronounces as e. Um, followed by u consonant as u. So, clawim yakit as clawi yakit. Final m at the end of a sentence he thinks was not heard at all. Uh, where a vowel followed, um, he believes that the M was never sounded and that fluctum was treated the same way as fluctu. So instead of saying fluctum, which is what I do with a nasalized vowel at the end, he said it would be fluctu. Instead of saying mensang, 
See, mensa. So, mensa. Mensa. Uh, if that were the case, uh, it would create a lot of confusion um, and it would be retrogressive to, to do so, I think. It would make, uh, make it more difficult to understand. Um, he thinks the final vowel before M uh, being simply slurred on to the following one completely. It's also possible that a vowel was nasalized when it was immediately followed by NS. Now, this is what I do as well. Um, and this is a generally accepted uh, um, thing that Alan agrees with, for example. This would explain the frequent omission of the N in such as Kases, uh, Kesor, appearing on inscriptions uh, by Kesor, Kosul for Konsul, and Insanus uh, uh, would be pronounced as Esanus, uh, Frons for France, Frondis also written France, and use France. So let's run through, go back up again. So that was all the stuff about pronouncing um, the letter M. So PBM, as in English, except for all of these caveats and the dispute about M. Um, I don't know anybody that goes mensang grauem uh, with such an extreme um, pronunciation. So, I, consonant, as in English, Y. Yugum, yakio. So, yugum, yakio. And let's look down at footnote 10. Footnote 10. In a number of cases, the I was pronounced twice, though only written once. So, in ob yikio, it was pronounced Ob yikio, not obikio, ob yikio. Let's run up again. Um, U, consonant. Probably as the English W. So, wanus, wis, servo. So, wanus, wis, servo. Uh, there's no ancient authority for spelling I consonant as J and U consonant as V. However, these are helpful and uh, I think that the convention, if you're going to do a U and a V, then you might as well do an I and a J. So either you do none of them or both of them. But some printers do uh, U, V and they just have an I all the time for IJ. Um, the Renaissance texts tend to have the J and the V and the U and the, uh, the, the, the V and the I, of course, I and J and U and V. So the Romans used one symbol for both the vowel and the consonant. Let's run through to footnote 11 down here slowly. Apologize for scrolling like this. Footnote 11. So this letter W may have been pronounced as a French in oui, oui, um, which is a slightly different sound to the English W, but not that dissimilar. So R. Um, once again, also on, particularly on my um, exemplar of the Lord's Prayer in classical pronunciation, there's lots of comment about my pronunciation of R, because um, I pronounce it quite strongly. Uh, according to the uh, Cambridge Philological Society here, trilled R, as in French or Scotch, more strongly trilled than in English opera and herring. Um, so, ringi. Rarus, dator, and nota bene, the final R should be fully sounded. This is something that English people have trouble with. R is the dog's letter. Rrr. Um, irritata canis. Quam homo, quam um, planiu dicit uh, Lucilius. So, also we find RH uh, in borrowed words. Pirhus um, and this is the corresponding voiceless sound as in the French théâtre. R. The trilled R is uh, represented by um, R in the examples given below. So it's using two R's. Let's run down here and find the footnote about R. So here we have it. The proper rolling of the R is most important, especially at the end of words. 
the English tendency being to slur all unaccented finals. Thus, let's scroll down. Thus, 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 pronounce er, ir, ur. Uh, English people would say er, ir, ur without any distinction with the same single vowel and assimilate them all to the final short a and consequently make no difference in sound between um, mater, amator, and amata. That's if you were pronouncing it in English. Um, but uh, I've done that in the restored classical pronunciation. Mata, mata, amata. So, lewir is pronounced um, lever. Um, if you were an Englishman. In reading verse, this destroys the meter by producing hiatus. Flata erit is pronounced as though it were flata erit. Flatur erit. So also in other cases. Um, I'm not going to go over them because uh, so uer, kur, and weir were all pronounced alike in the English pronunciation with the same vowel sound and no r, and they should be sounded as um, where, kur, and weir. The mispronunciation is not confined to finals. So an English person would say arbo, uh, arba, right? Instead of saying arbor. So it should be arbor. An Englishman would say wert it, but it should be wert it. So let's go up back to the uh, R. Here we have it. That's R. So ringi, rarus, and dator. Quite a strong pronunciation. The Italians get a bit incensed because they say it should be a gentle, mellifluous R. Quite frankly, it doesn't matter if it's a strong R or a weak R, as long as it's clearly pronounced um, in all cases. So CH and TH and PH are like K, T and P followed by the letter H. So Bacchus, Ketegus, Poibus. Um, and this is something that I do. Um, uh, Philosophia. So it's quite a clear articulation of the H after the consonant. Let's look at uh, note 13 down here. Um, these sounds are heard in Ireland. Um, they may be obtained by pronouncing ink horn, pot house, tap house. So, so that the mute comes into the second syllable. Ink horn, pot to house, tap house. It's quite incorrect to pronounce it to her as th and p her as th, which you do hear um, with people who are new to restored classical pronunciation um, and they get it wrong. So these are Greek sounds in Latin. F as in English, um, ferweo, wafer, and H as in English, hora, inkoho. And you'll get people who are insistent that the H was not pronounced in Latin at this time. However, the academic consensus is unanimous that it was. And the Roman grammarians are quite clear about it, that it was as well. There are some words where it's not, um, and we know what those words were. Compound and doubled consonants. So X as in X. So exulto, pax and saxum. We don't say um, exulto, so exulto. Um, BS, um, note that the PS sound in the word urps is um, pronounced with a P. So urps, urps, it's pronounced ps, even though it's written BS. So absorpeo, urps, is pronounced with a P and not with a B. Z. Right, the pronunciation of this letter is doubtful um, and it's either dz or zd. 
it's, this, it's never Z by itself. It's a double consonant, and it's either D before Z or Z before D, like ads. So it's either Gazda or Gazda. It's either Zephyrus or Zephyrus. Or, um, Zephyrus. It's a Greek sound. Ka should be taken with doubled consonants. Where we find in classical times the two symbols regularly written, we may infer that two sounds were intended to be represented. This is true of explosives, as in waka, kippus, agger, in sounding which a distinct pause ought to be made, as in Italian, between the two sounds, waka, kippus, agger. It is also true of fricatives, as in metellus, penna, ferrum, possum, difficilis. But where the spelling varies, as in causa, polio, we may infer that the sound was but a somewhat prolonged fricative, causa, polio. So in some words we have this clear distinction between the two letters, and in some it's more of a glide. Um, in my restored classical, I'm quite careful about this, um, and some people say, no, it should always be a glide, and uh, you get comments on my pronunciation sometimes. Why are you doing this? Um, I'm doing it because the academics say this is what should be done. Before the doubled sounds, um, the accent was commonly stronger and the vowel short. Elision of vowels. Final vowels or diphthongs when followed by other vowels or diphthongs or the letter H were not cut off but were very lightly pronounced and run on to the following vowel as in Italian. So this is what Cicero at Kikro means by coniungere vocales um, to join the vowels together. And thus we should pronounce ego er as an egeo. Not egeo, but egeo. So, ille ibit as an ileibit. Ileibit, not ilibit. So the vowel isn't cut off completely. And I do this in my pronunciation. I don't completely cut off the vowel. Um, some people, when they're speaking restored classical, do this they go ilibit not ilibit so this little tiny remnant of the sound which i'm highlighting here and here um, should remain so egoio not egeo ilibit not ilibit it's quite tricky to do but you get used to it so where the two vowels were the same as in markella amat the effect was that of a single long vowel. Similarly, where a vowel was followed by um, a diphthong beginning with the same vowel as in contra audentior, this had the effect of contra audentior. Um, and this is, so these vowels fuse contra audentior. So if you have a long vowel here, a long sound here, the sounds run into each other. For the pronunciation of a vowel and final M before a following vowel, or H, C, L, 9 above, quantity. Now this is one reason why restored classical is vastly superior than the Florentine pronunciation used nowadays um, by the Catholic Church, or some Catholic churches. And traditional medieval pronunciations. Quantity is absent in that pronunciation completely. So the observance of quantity is of vital importance for the proper appreciation of meter in Latin poetry and rhythm in Latin prose. It's hard to do for an English speaker because you have long unstressed vowels and those are alien to our language. So the short and long vowels in Latin differed in duration as in the first and second vowel, in aha, or in quinine, 
So there we have examples. Quinine. Aha! And this difference should be very carefully observed. Um, the practice of lengthening the accented vowels is entirely alien to the classical pronunciation of Latin. So, kibus, not kaibus. Um, amo, not amo. Right? Sacro, not sacro. Now, notice that you have a long, unaccented vowel on the end of the word. So, amo. Don't mistake the long vowel for a stress. It's not a stress. Um, but if you're not accustomed to the sound of the long vowels, you might think that someone's stressing the end of a word when they're not. Amo. And notice the tone goes up, ah, and drops at the end, mo. Um, because the tone drops at the end of Latin words. A special cam is required where a vowel follows in the next syllable. Hence, we should pronounce suis, suis, and not both like suis, skiunt, not siunt. Um, so the old English pronunciation is pretty much gone, so you're not going to make those mistakes um, if you learn the restored classical from the beginning. The shortening and slurring of the unaccented vowel is equally faulty in the English pronunciation. So, Victoria, so, Oria, Victoria, is to be carefully distinguished from um, Victoria, Ratis, from ratis. A special form of this fault is pronouncing words like dea, rea, as if the two vowels formed a diphthong and so making them monosyllables, dea and rea, instead of disyllables, dea, rea. Every vowel has a quantity of its own. And the English practice of pronouncing all vowels in position before two or more consonants as if they were naturally short is erroneous. Uh, the Romans said secta, but they said rectus, tectus, inductus, but insula, infensus. And there's a long vowel before ns. Um, accent. The nature of the Latin accent has been much discussed. It was certainly different from the English accent, which consists in pronouncing the accented syllable with a much greater emphasis or stress than the adjacent syllables. It seems clear that the Latin accent was partly a pitch and partly a stress accent, which is the way I pronounce my restored classical. I use the pitch and I use the stress. Or, in other words, that the accented syllable was pronounced in a higher key and also with greater force than the unaccented syllables. The difference in pitch is vouched for, inter alia, uh, by the well-known statement of Cicero in the Orator. Um, the Latin acuta denoted that the voice rose on the accented syllable. Such an accent has been called a rising tone, and the Latin gravis would naturally be the lower tone of the unaccented syllables. And the curcum flexa, or inflexa, as Cicero calls it, the voice would first rise and then fall on the same syllable, pluma, which is what I do when I speak Latin in my restored classical pronunciation. There are very, very few speakers of restored classical who do this. Um, it took me quite a long time to learn how to do it and to do it well. Um, pluma. Um, it gives the Latin a sort of a sort of bouncy feeling. Um, the exact amount of difference in pitch between the accented and unaccented syllables cannot now be ascertained. So we don't know exactly how the Romans did it, but we know that they did do it. And so to speak Latin 
in a monotone as though you are giving a funeral oration or speaking like a priest delivering a sermon in church uh, is not how the, the, the Romans um, spoke. Their Latin was, had a bounce to it. It had these variations in, in pitch. Um, as regards the difference in stress, it is to be remarked first that it manifests itself in a number of ways in the tendency to draw away the accent as far as may be from the last syllable, to alter both the quantity and the character of the vowels in unaccented syllables, and to affect the final consonants of a word. Secondly, that the difference of force or vigor with which accented and unaccented syllables were respectively pronounced was considerably less than in English. Accordingly, the accented vowels should be pronounced much more gently and the unaccented ones much more distinctly than it's at present the custom. And special attention should be paid to this. I'm just going to run up here to a footnote which I missed. Um, and this is the footnote. The natural length of a vowel must be distinguished from the conventional lengthening which it is said to undergo before two consonants. So this is uh, not actual lengthening as in pronunciation, it's the um, so in doctus, the e is short, um, but the fact that nd follow allows the syllable to be treated in verse as if it were naturally long, um, as in e, but but it's not a long i. In sanus, the vowel itself is long. Insanus. What vowels were naturally long and short cannot be completely determined, but we have a very good, um, now we, this is 1880, we have much more information, much more knowledge about, about Latin, much more analysis of the text by computers and by philologians, etc. Um, but we learn from ancient authorities that vowels were long before the combinations ns and nf, so constants, and also before gn, regnum, signum, and at least sometimes before nc and nq, quinque, quinctus, sanctus. Where a g became c before t and s, the preceding vowel became long, as in lectus from lego, while from seco we have sectus. The vowel is frequently long before R and a consonant Marcus, Mars, Ordo, Orno. The natural quantity of the vowel was retained when two consonants followed, as in scriptus from scribo. And here we have reference to two um, German books. If you go on to archive.org, there's a small book by Bennett, B-E-N-N-E-T-T, -T, called The Sounds and the Inflections of the Latin Language. And in that text, he gives a very useful list of all of these words that have long vowels um, by nature, um, what is called hidden quantity, as in um, you can't tell without studying the word, if the vowel is a long one, or if it's a long syllable with a short vowel. Um, this is something that takes a lot of time um, to learn. If you do go onto um, my site and listen to me, I'm very careful to be as accurate as I can when I, I do this. So if you listen to a lot of accurate Latin, then you'll start to just get it right without much effort. The problem comes from listening to people whose pronunciation falls short of the standards, that the, um, the academic standards, and then you pick up bad, bad habits. Um, so that's that. This is uh, a seminal text, one of the uh, first, this is like the, the first canon shot, I suppose, this text. It's spread out across the English-speaking world. Um, and uh, in schools in England, this pronunciation was adopted. The old English pronunciation was dropped. And the Italian pronunciation was not adopted in England um, because, uh, well, for various reasons, I suppose it's a Protestant country. Um, 
and the historical English pronunciation died a death. So that is um, this little book. I'm not sure what's the next part. It's got a, a wee way to go here, but I think it might be the end of it. Um, let's have a look and see what we have here. It looks like a large number of blank pages. And so it is. I'm not sure why. But I think that's the end of that. So that's from the Cambridge Philological Society. I'm just scrolling up here and to give you the dates of this text. My apologies. It seems to have as many empty pages at the beginning as at the end. So the pronunciation of Latin in the Augustan period, and this is uh, Oh, what's happened here? Seems to be having a bad day. Um, okay, I'm not quite sure what's happened here. Um, but we appear to have lost the date. But it's 1880 something. 1887. There we have it. So this is this is one of the early texts uh, promoting the restored classical pronunciation of Latin. Um, if you want to find my materials, then you can look at latinum.org.uk, or you can go on to the patreon.com website and type in latinum, L-A-T-I-N-U-M, or just Latin and you'll find um, my material there. Extensive Latin courses and Latin resources, um, hundreds and hundreds of hours of material, and I am constantly uploading new material to the Patreon site. So I hope you enjoyed this historical text, um, and uh, good luck with your Latin. Bye.